All right, I'm going to show you proof today that Jesus Christ did not understand the Trinity. Okay, now this is said slightly in jest. Obviously, the Lord Jesus Christ is the source of all truth. Um, he understands false teachings, certainly. But I'm going to show you some more scriptures that really contradict this teaching, this pagan Catholic teaching that there is this Trinity, this, this three gods, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and they're three separate individual persons and yet one in essence. I'm going to show you some scriptures that debunk that yet again. There's lots of them, but uh, I'm going to show you a couple. Um, and I'm going to also show you from the catechism where, you know, the Catholic catechism here, where a lot of these unscriptural, uh, extra scriptural uh, things come from that these people, these Trinity people use. Uh, you see, the King James Bible teaches the Godhead. And the Godhead is God, the Father, Jesus Christ, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And all three are one. Not in essence, the three are one. The Bible teaches that in Jesus Christ, in Him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. The book of Colossians talks about that. So you have Jesus Christ being the, the body, God the Father being the soul, and the Holy Ghost obviously is the spirit. That's why the Bible talks about man being created in God's image. All right, It's three in one. I'm going to show you the proof of that today. Go to John chapter 2, verse 18. And I will publicly renounce any time that I've ever said the word Trinity. All right, I used to say that uh, ignorantly. I've always believed that Jesus Christ is the body, God is the soul, and the Holy Ghost is the spirit. I've always believed that. Um, but I've mistakenly said, well, if you call it the Trinity, it's not a big deal. Oh, yes, it is a big deal. Uh, why? Well, because it's not a uh, word that appears in the King James Bible. So you ought not to be using it. If you're a Bible-believing Christian, then you stick by the language of the King James Bible. And the language of the King James Bible says Godhead, not Trinity. And I'm going to show you why it's important to stay away from this Trinity concept. John chapter 2, verse 18 through 22. It says here, Then answered the Jews and said unto him, What sign showest thou unto us, seeing that thou doest these things? Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days... I will raise it up. Destroy the temple and Jesus says, I will raise it up, meaning himself. Verse 20, Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? But he spake of the temple of his body. When therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this unto them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. And that's really the key right there. Do you believe the scriptures and the words that Jesus says? You see, if you go with the Catholic Trinity teaching, then you can't rely just on the scriptures. You have to add things to the scriptures, like the word Trinity. Watch them. Ask them. These people that believe in the Trinity and things as three separate gods, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost, those people that believe that, they refuse to call that thing that they believe in, their trinity, they refuse to call it the Godhead. They'll do that. They might well, they might do it just for the sake of argument, but they'll go right back to saying trinity again. They won't stick by the King James Bible. There's a reason for that. But you say, Where, I don't understand here. What, what do you mean proof that Jesus didn't understand the trinity? Well, you realize here in John chapter 2, verse 18, actually down verse 19 specifically, 18 through 22, but verse 19 specifically, he says, and in three days, I will raise it up. Right? There's a bunch of other scriptures we could go to as well to prove what I'm saying. But go next to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. Other places talk about Jesus Christ raising up himself. But look at Acts chapter 2, verse 30 through 32. It says here, therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. Huh? Um, God there in context, talking about the father. Look at it. God had sworn with an oath to him that the fruit of his loins. Jesus is begotten of God, the father. That's what it's talking about here. 
God in the in the in verse thirty there is talking about God the Father. You can't say, well, that, no, that's God the Son. Uh, God the Son, if you want to go with that Catholic Trinity teaching, um, God the Son did not beget, you know, God the Son. <laughs> All right, it's talking about God the Father begetting His Son Jesus Christ. Verse thirty one. He seeing this before spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we all are witnesses. God. In context, it's the Father. He raised Jesus up. But no, no, you see, this is where this is where Jesus is confused, you know, wink wink. <laughs> um, because Jesus said that he is going to raise himself up. But here it says, God raised him up. And obviously in context, it can't be talking about, if you want to make it God the Son like the Trinity people teach, it's talking about the Father. So one place in Scripture says God, meaning the Father, here in Acts chapter 2, God the Father raised up Jesus. Another place it's saying that Jesus raises up himself. Which one was it? Well, if you're a Bible-believing Christian and you believe in the scriptural you know, Godhead, then you realize it's both. Jesus Christ is God. Not that hard to figure out. Turn back to the book of John, chapter 3 and verse 13. John chapter 3, verse 13. It says here, And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. No, that's not right. You see, because God the Son, <laughs> the Trinity teaching, um, he's, he's on the earth, you see, bodily on the earth. How could he be in heaven then? You say, well, it's the same thing as what we have today. No, it isn't, because we are seated together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. How could Jesus Christ be down here? Who is he in in heaven? How could he be in heaven and on earth at the same time? It's possible for a Christian because we're connected to Jesus Christ. We're part of his body, bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh. We're connected to Jesus Christ. Who is Jesus Christ connected to? You see, what's the, it, it's the, you see, it's the essence. It's the essence of the Trinity. Where's the word essence of the Trinity? It's not there. Go to uh, Matthew chapter 30, or Matthew, Matthew chapter 10. Again, I'll show you the confusion here that Jesus had. He just didn't understand this thing of the three different gods. Matthew chapter 10, verse 32 and 33. Whosoever therefore shall confess me before, my, before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. John 3, 13. And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. Now, is Jesus Christ confused here? Over in Matthew chapter 10, verse 32 and 33, he says, My Father is in heaven. John chapter 3, verse 13, he says, The Son of Man is in heaven. Which one is it? Again, if you believe in the biblical Godhead, you understand it's both. Both statements are true. God the Father is in heaven, and God the Father is the soul of Jesus Christ. That's the connection there. He's connected to his Father in heaven. Not a problem if you believe the King James Bible, but if you want to go with pagan Catholic traditions uh, that turn you from the truth, you know, and, and again, think about this. I'm going to be showing you what the Catholic Catechism says here in just a minute, but think about this. Do you really believe that lost Catholics that the Lord's going to reveal truth about himself, the mystery of godliness is great, unless you're a Catholic, then God just gives it to you, and you can freely, easily understand it. While they're out molesting children, and while they're out, you know, lying to people, and getting drunk behind the scenes, and whatever else, they understand the Trinity. <laughs> yeah, well, they might understand the Trinity, but that's not the Godhead of the Bible. Insane. John chapter 14.
John chapter 14, I'll show you the third one. Third time where Jesus gets the... He doesn't understand the Trinity. You know, he just doesn't get it. He contradicts himself, you see. He says something about himself, and then he compares it to another member of the Godhead, you know, and making it all look like they're all just one, you know. Not terrible. <laughs> John chapter 14, verse 16 through 18. It says here, And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit. God's going to give you the comforter, the Holy Spirit. You say, how do you know? Just hold it right there. Go up to uh, verse 26. But the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, is there any doubt as to who this is? The comforter, which is the Holy Ghost. Over here in verse 17, it says, even the Spirit of truth. Finish up verse 26. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. All right? He's sending him in Jesus' name. But look at this. Look at, the, look at the context of verse 16 down through 18. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another Comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. Jesus is standing there saying, it seeth him not, this comforter. It seeth him not. Well, you're looking at Jesus, the guys that he's talking to, they're looking right at Jesus. Remember that. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. What do you mean? You're going to come to us. What, huh? You're standing right here. I will come to you. The, whole, the, the Father is going to send the Comforter, even the Spirit of Truth. I will come to you. Huh? You see how confused Jesus Christ is again? He talks about the Holy Ghost, the Comforter, and then he comes and says, I will come to you. While he's standing right there talking to him. And he says about... Uh, because, it, you know, whom the world cannot receive because it seeth, seeth him not. Again, he's standing there, he's talking to them, they're seeing him, and he says, I'm going to come to you, and you're not going to see me, you're going to, you know, I'm going to, I'm the Spirit of Truth. Jesus is making himself the Holy Spirit, God's Holy Spirit there. Why? Because all three are one. In him, in the body of Jesus Christ, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So he can talk about God the Father in heaven, because it's the soul that's up there. Again, the Bible teaches that a Christian is seated together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus right now. While you're walking around on the earth as a Christian, a born-again Christian, your soul is in heaven. How does that work? Isn't that something? Read the King James Bible. All right? The King James Bible teaches that the Godhead is three in one. They are separate in, in the sense of body, soul, spirit, but they're not three separate persons walking around. They have the ability, God the Father can split off from you know, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Ghost can split off. That's true. They can split off. We can't do that, all right? at least in the sense of the way God does it. But this is, this is, this is the whole thing. You can't wrap your mind around this. So the bunch of pagan Catholics come along and they say, oh, we'll help you figure it out. Don't worry. God's revealed it to us in our different councils and, and things. I'll show you here in just a minute. Kind of weird. But look at, uh, again, I've talked about this thing over and over and over again. I mean, if you want the clearest, in my opinion, the clearest statement on Jesus Christ actually being the Father, God the Father, look up at verse 8. Actually, we'll go to verse 7. Jesus speaking here, he says, If ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also, and from henceforth ye know him, and have seen him. Verse 8, Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known the Father, Philip? No, he says, Me, Philip. Philip says, Show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Show us the Father. Where's the Father at? And Jesus says, don't you know me? Huh? Look what he says. 
He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, show us the Father? Some guy comes along, I'm outside working, and he says, excuse me, do you know where I could find Brian Denlinger? And I say, you're looking at him. You think the guy's going to say, oh, you mean in, in as far as the substance of Brian Denlinger, I'm looking at, but technically, you're not technically Brian Denlinger, because you see, you're Brian the Son. I'm looking for Brian the Father, and Brian the Spirit, he's someplace else that I don't know about. They're, they're three different. Where's Brian the Father? That's the one I was like. You see how mentally insane this whole thing is if you're a Catholic Trinity believer? Philip comes and he says, show us the Father and it sufficeth us. Jesus says, he that hath seen me hath seen the Father. In other words, in modern day vernacular, which I'm not going to change the scriptures, but to understand it in modern day speaking, Jesus says, you're looking at him. That's what it says. But... Be very careful when you have these Catholics come along, these papists, and you can spot them very easily nowadays. They just, they've tried to infiltrate this movement, movement for a long time, and they will insist on using the word Trinity. They will insist on bringing all this other stuff into the scriptures. They add to the scriptures all the time. If you want to know what Roman Catholicism's number one sin is, it is adding to the scriptures. Think about it. Think of all their divine tradition and all the, the, the church fathers and the church councils and and all the things, you know, we need to build this big basilica. Where's that at in Scripture? We have to have a pope, a cardinal, bishop, archbishop, priest, monk, nun, you know, all sacrament, sacraments and, and Eucharist and transubstantiation and, and all. Where's it at in Scripture? They've added it, you see. The way you can spot a papist is somebody comes along and they add stuff to Scripture. And you say, wait a second here. What did you tell me? There's, well, it's the divine essence. Um, let me look that word up. Oh, uh, hey, you know, the divine essence isn't in here. You just called yourself a papist. They add to Scripture more so than anybody else. That's the whole truth of the matter. But, you know, I'm a researcher. I like to research things and try to find out truth on things. And so I thought, okay, well, the word Trinity is not in here. And I've done the research. I'm going to show you here from the Catechism. keep saying that, but I'm going to show you. And, uh, you know, Trinity's not in there, but I, I heard this thing of divine essence, and I thought, well, let me look it up, and it's certainly not in there, divine essence. But I thought, you know, that that sounds like it should be something. I mean, that's kind of impressive almost, but not really. You know, divine essence, divine essence. And guess what? I found divine essence. You ready to see it? Let me put a picture up for you here. I'll enlighten you to what divine essence is. You ready? Here you go. Look at that. Divine essence. It's a rose extra, you know, organic too. Hey, you're doing pretty good there. And then I found a similar thing. This one is essence divine. Look at that one. All right. It's close. Close. Don't, it doesn't quite have the same ring to it. Essence divine. Eh, it's a little bit backwards. But then I got on Etsy. And guess what I found? A whole set of divine essence perfumes. All right. Custom bespoke. I am not going to even try to say that. Spray custom natural perfume. Organic artisan perfume. Botanical perfume vegan. All right. $200 for that thing too. So, you know, that's, that's the divine essence. I mean, I guess maybe these people that stand for the Catholic Trinity... This is the divine essence that they're talking about. I mean, it's not in Scripture, so maybe this is what it is. And, you know, these effeminate men that, that talk about the Trinity and maybe they're spraying divine essence on themselves. Or helps their other girlfriends to, you know, whatever. But, uh, but you know, found this book on Amazon.com. Check this out. Uh, divine Essence and Divine Energies, Ecumenical Reflections on the Presence of God in Eastern Orthodoxy. Ooh, you know, that sounds good. A composite book of essays from 10 scholars, Divine Essence and Divine Energies, provides a rich repository of diverse uh, opinion about the essence-energy distinction in Orthodox Christianity, a doctrine which lies at the heart of the often fraught fault line between East and West, and which in this book inspires a lively dialogue between the contributors. The contents of the book revolve around several key questions in what uh, way were the Aristotelian 
concepts of usia and energia, I'm just, I don't care how you say that, <laughs> used by the church fathers, and to what extent were their meanings modified in the light of the Christological and Trinitarian doctrines. There you go, Trinitarian doctrines. What the theolo or what theological function does the essence energy distinction fulfill in Eastern Orthodoxy with respect to theology, anthropology, and the doctrine of creation? What are the differences and similarities between the notions of divine presence and participation in seminal Christian writings? And what is the relationship between the essence energy distinction and Western ideas of divine presence? A valuable addition to the dialogue between Eastern and Western Christianity. I don't think so. This book will be of great interest to any reader seeking a rigorous, rigorously academic insight into the wealth of scholarly opinion regarding the essence energy distinction, also known as... <laughs> it's the kind of stuff that makes God sick, all right? Disgusting. You know, I mean, the church fathers and the church councils, and we need to discuss these things and consider this stuff. You ready? Check this out. I mean, I've, I've preached on this thing of the Godhead for years and years and years. Like I said, I mistakenly called it the Trinity different times. The, ter the term is Godhead. I apologize publicly for ever saying Trinity. That's not the term. Godhead. But I've talked about it for years. And all of a sudden, it just, you know, everything just hit the fan. And I'm going, whoa, you know, I'm getting called a heretic and a modalist and all this other stuff. You know, and I thought, why is this so important? What is the big deal here? Page 69 of the Roman Catholic Catechism says here, paragraph 2, the Father. And it says, number 232, the faith of all Christians rests on the Trinity. The faith of all Christians rests on the Trinity. Now, actually, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. This is more important than this teaching of Godhead versus Trinity. The authority of Scripture God has magnified His Word above His name. The teaching of how the Godhead all works out and everything else is not as important as the authority of Scripture. Number 234. The mystery of the Most Holy Trinity is the central mystery of Christian faith and life. It is the mystery of God in Himself. It is therefore the source of all the other mysteries of faith, the light that enlightens them. Hmm. All of a sudden it becomes really clear why you have all these papists out there getting so upset because Bible believers start to discuss this thing of the papal trinity versus the biblical, the King James Bible term, Godhead. And the teaching, the King James teaching that Jesus Christ is God the Father. All of a sudden it comes to light, doesn't it? Because, you know, I was confused. About it. I'm going, okay, what's the big deal here? Why is everybody getting so upset? Now I understand why. Because it's the primary teaching, the principal doctrine of Roman Catholicism. That's why you have a book like, uh, uh, where's the thing at? I thought I had it over there. The, um, it's where my other James White books are. But you have this, this, oh, here it is. Here you go. The Forgotten Trinity by James White. And on the back, right here, it's endorsed by a Jesuit, right there, Mitch Paqua. And Norman Geisler, another Jesuit. Jesuit trained. But, you know, you look up the, the whole thing there, the, the definition of, you know, what the Jesuits consider, the Jesuits themselves consider somebody being part of the Jesuit family. Uh, anybody that's been to a Jesuit university is part of the Jesuit family. Again, that's in our Ken Hoven thing, you know, exposing him. But rather interesting. This Trinity concept is extremely important to the Papists. If you saw my video about the thing of the future, this Catholic Trinity thing, um, you understand why. In the time of Jacob's Trouble, I believe that the Catholics have a literal, physical Trinity on the earth. False prophet, the Antichrist, and Satan himself. Hmm. They need to have the three distinct and yet all one in essence. But you aren't going to believe 
they admit in the catechism where they got the term essence from. You're not going to believe this one. Page 70, it is the most fundamental and essential teaching in the hierarchy of the truths of the faith. Of faith, excuse me. The most fundamental and essential teaching. The papal trinity. But Number 239, check this out. We ought therefore to recall that God transcends the human distinction between the sexes. He is neither man nor woman. He is God. I kid you not. Let me zoom in here so you can see it. You're looking at it right there. And here's the other quote up there on that page. Hopefully you can see that. Okay. How about that? Let's turn over another page or two here. Um, this is page 74. And it says, The Holy Trinity and the Teaching of the Faith. Okay, right there you have it. I'll read it and then I'll zoom in so you can see it. It says, The Formation of the Trinitarian Dogma. It's a dogma. From the beginning, number 249, from the beginning, the revealed truth of the Holy Trinity has been at the very root of the church's living faith, principally by means of baptism. Exactly what a lot of these fakers are teaching. It's that important. Oh, you got it. It's just so important and everything else. And they get just rabid when you kick this Trinity thing, this Catholic Trinity thing. Isn't that interesting? I mean, when's the last time you saw real Bible-believing Christians arguing about the Godhead? Number 250. During the first centuries, the church sought to clarify its Trinitarian faith. Hmm. This clarification was the work of the early councils, aided by the theological work of the church fathers and sustained by the Christian people's sense of the faith. They added to the scriptures, in other words. But now here's the good one. Number 251 in the Catholic Catechism, right here, I'm going to show it. In order to articulate the dogma of the Trinity, the church had to develop its own terminology, get that one, with the help of certain notions of philosophical origin. I kid you not, that's what it says. Substance, person, or hypo hypostasis, relation, and so on. In doing this, she did not submit the faith to human wisdom. Yes, she did. But gave a new and unprecedented, unprecedented meaning to these terms, which from then on would be used to signify an ineffable mystery infinitely beyond all that we can humanly understand. Catholic doublespeak, you gotta love it. We went to, you know, human wisdom, philosophers, so that we could give you uh, terms and meaning and things like this that transcends human understanding. <laughs> okay, um, so you, you needed to go to man to make new terms that don't appear in the scriptures so that man could better understand the scriptures. <whistles> Number 252. The term, the church uses the term substance rendered also at times by essence or nature to designate the divine being in its unity. I'm a King James Bible believer and I believe in divine essence. Where's that in scripture? Show me that word in scripture. Well, it's not in there, but, but you know, it, it, it explains the Trinity. Well, it explains the Trinity all right. The Trinity is a pagan Catholic concept with no basis in the King James Bible. Let me zoom in here. Get this stupid thing held up so you can see it. Okay. There you have that. And down here. You can pause this and read it. 
right there. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy. Over here talks about divine essence. You are looking at it. From the Catholic Catechism. So these people come out. I don't want to name names or anything. It doesn't really matter because they'll just keep coming out with more and more papist devils to try and get this thing through to the body of Christ. They'll keep coming out and they'll say, well, you know, when, when Jesus was saying, he that hath seen me hath seen the Father, what he was really talking about is God the Son and God the Father are one in essence. Where did you get it from? Philosophers. The Vatican. You know why I don't use that term? Because I wasn't trained as a Catholic. That's why. I'm not saying I didn't ever, you know, I never heard it growing up or whatever else. I might have heard it in the independent Bible church I went to growing up or Methodist church or some of the Baptist churches or whatever else, but it never sunk into my head. Why? Because it wasn't the Holy Spirit leading those people to talk about divine essence. It's a pagan Catholic concept from philosophers admitted by the Catholic Catechism. It's right there. I had a brother write me the one time we got, you know, this this whole Godhead thing when it all came out and everything else, and, and it really started to create this big firestorm on the Internet, and, and, you know, a lot of the papist, you know, the covert papists were coming out of the woodwork and preaching and denouncing this horrible thing of modalism or whatever other kind of deal or whatever else, all these little words that they come up with. Again, the Catholics, they'll do this thing of labeling certain groups so that they can categorize people and try to shame you. Well, you're a modalist. You're falling for modalism or Sibelianism or, or all these other things. You're a heretic. You know, they come up with all these little heretic names. They can't just stick with the Bible, you know. Again, they have to add to Scripture, you know. But I remember this brother and I were writing back and forth, a brother named Brian, and, um, and he said to me, he said, you know, it's really just so clear. When you look at the King James Bible, Jesus Christ is God the Father. It's right there. You know, and he said, is it really that easy to tell who's lost and who's saved? Yeah, it is. It really is. Somebody comes out and they defend this Catholic Trinity after hearing the arguments, they're lost. They're not saved. It's just as simple as that. I mean, it's it's the central core teaching. It's the, it's the foundation of the faith, according to the Catholic Catechism. It's not the core teaching of the Scriptures, I'll tell you that. The core teaching of the Scriptures is about Jesus Christ, the manifest Word, and the written Word of God as your final authority. That's the core teaching of the Scriptures. If God magnifies His Word, Psalm 138 talks about that, if God magnifies His Word above His name... Um, I think that this is a bit more important than how the whole Godhead thing works out. And the fact of the matter is, the Bible teaches that it's a mystery. We're not going to understand it with our finite minds down here on this earth. Have you been deceived by a papist? Have you been led astray by some covert Catholic that's infiltrated Bible-believing groups? If they believe in the Catholic Trinity, that's exactly what they are. You get some guy that preaches a Catholic Trinity, he's a papist. Why? Because it's their most important doctrine. That's why they get so rabid about it. And ask them to explain their concept of the Trinity without adding words to Scripture. They can't do it. They can't do it for one minute. They have to go to philosophers. Admitted. Be careful what you listen to, brethren. You need to be a Bible-believing Christian, a King James Bible-believing Christian, if you're saved. The Lord will get you to this book eventually. You'll give up the uh, Vatican versions, the NIV, the ESV, the NASV, whatever else. They all come from the Vatican. Look it up. Absolute proven fact. They all trace back to the Vatican. They say, well, the King James translators meant well, but they didn't have the best manuscripts. And we have two older and better manuscripts now. What are they? Sinaiticus and Vaticanus. 
codices Aleph and B. So in other words, Christians for centuries didn't have the true Word of God until the late 1800s with Westcott and Hort when they came out with the, oh, we found better manuscripts that were given to us by our friends at the Vatican. And now we can have a better, more accurate translation of Scripture. Somebody using a new version, stay away from them. Don't listen to them. Somebody is defending this Catholic Trinity, stay away from them. Don't listen to them. Two very easy ways that you can spot a papist. Be very careful who you're listening to out there.